Welcome to Transformed by Grace, an in-depth Bible study of God's Word presented by the Berean Bible Society. Join us each time on this station as Pastor Kevin brings the transforming message of God's grace revealed through the Holy Scriptures. Pamela Petler in her book, The Joy of Stress, wrote the following called The Stress Diet. Breakfast, half of a grapefruit, one piece whole wheat toast, eight ounces of skim milk. Lunch, four ounce lean broiled chicken breast, one cup steamed zucchini, one Oreo cookie, herb tea. Mid-afternoon snack. Rest of the package of Oreo cookies, one quart of Rocky Road ice cream, one jar of hot fudge. Dinner, two loaves, garlic bread, large mushroom and pepperoni pizza, large pitcher of root beer, three Milky Ways, an entire frozen cheesecake eaten directly from the freezer. Now, that's an example of someone who isn't dealing with stress very well. And Paul and those on the stormy voyage to Rome found themselves in a very stressful situation. And it was Paul who stood up in the middle of the storm to give strength, encouragement, and comfort to those on that ship. The stormy voyage is a picture of this present evil age. That ship is a picture of the church, the body of Christ. God is teaching the church that we need to look to Paul and his example and the truth that Christ revealed to Paul to find the strength and peace and comfort we need for this dispensation. Acts 27, 18 to 20 reads, And we, being exceedingly tossed with a tempest, the next day they lightened the ship. And the third day we cast out with our own hands the tackling of the ship. And when neither sun nor stars in many days appeared, and no small tempest lay on us, all hope that we should be saved was then taken away. On Paul's journey to Rome, they decided to, to set off from Fair Havens to Crete to travel 40 miles up the coast to Phoenice. Paul advised against it because it was a dangerous time of the year to sail on the Mediterranean. But because Phoenice was a more comfortable place to spend the winter, they decided to set out. At first, the soft wind blew and it seemed like the right decision. But then a northeasterner hit suddenly and the ship was caught in a great storm. On the second day of the storm, it became necessary to lighten the ship, and they started throwing some of the cargo, the wheat, overboard. On the third day, they threw the tackling of the ship overboard. Evidently, the ship was taking water, so all that wasn't necessary for survival and all that wasn't nailed down needed to go. Beds, cables, lines, baggage, chests, chairs, tables, any extra gear, all of it went overboard. Luke wrote that they cast out the tackling with our own hands, meaning that Paul, Luke, and Aristarchus took part. Every man, every person was pressed into service. And that's a reminder that during the storm of this age, the church needs every person's service. Every member of the body of Christ is vitally important, and your gifts and talents and labor is needed in the church. Verse 18 says that the ship was exceedingly tossed with a tempest. And that reminds us of Ephesians 4.14, that we henceforth be no more children tossed to and fro and carried about with every wind of doctrine by the slight of men and cunning craftiness, whereby they lie in wait to deceive. Because of not following Paul and following sound doctrine, sound teaching in this dispensation. The winds of bad doctrine and doctrines of devils have tossed the church to and fro and carried people away from the truth. People are being tossed around by bad teaching, tossed back and forth, up and down, to and fro, carried about with every wind of doctrine. The answer is to look to Paul's message for this dispensation of grace. This truth establishes the believer. It brings stability. It causes us to be rooted 
and built up in Christ and established in the faith, as Colossians 2.7 says. After many days of not seeing the sun or stars, not being able to navigate, the men started losing help of ever making it out of the situation alive. Sailors need to see the sun and the stars. They need to see the truth in the heavens to properly navigate the ship. And the church cannot properly navigate this dispensation of grace without looking to the heavens, without looking to Christ's heavenly message revealed to Paul for the church in God's word. The truth in the heavens given to Paul by Christ is what is to guide the church today. This message reveals our heavenly hope, our heavenly calling, our heavenly citizenship. If we do not follow this heavenly truth for today, we are not setting our course properly, and we are not being navigated according to God's will for us in this dispensation of grace. There was no relief from the fierce storm. The ship was now a leaky, battered, cleaned out hulk. In verse 20, when Luke says, and no small tempest lay on us, the word lay means beat. The storm was beating on them. The sea pounded the ship and it pounded them and they were all beat down physically and mentally. As the situation got more dire, more perilous and worse and worse, it reminds us how things in this dispensation will get worse and worse as the age draws to a close. 1 Timothy 3, 1 and 13 reads, This know also that in the last days perilous times shall come, but evil men and seducers shall wax worse and worse. Waves were crashing, the ship was tossing and turning up one side of the waves and down the other. The picture is of the unrest and chaos of the world through the wind and strong influence of the powers of darkness. As a result, the church in this world, like that ship, is tossed all over the place by this constantly changing, chaotic, and dangerous world. And as a result of it all, we can be beat down. There was a constant drenching rain and spray. No fire could be lit. No cooking could be done. No one could rest. And then they began to give up hope. Verse 20 says, all hope that we should be saved was then taken away. But that is what happens if we don't keep the faith, keep to the message committed to Paul. And when you don't listen to what Christ teaches us in it for today, you start wondering. You start worrying and doubting and thinking. All hope that we should be saved is taken away. The assurance of salvation can be taken away when you don't follow Paul. In other places in Scripture, you learn about the need to endure to the end to be saved. The need to abide in Christ, to overcome. That's instruction for the nation of Israel under a different program. But in Paul's message, we learn that when you trust Christ, you're in Christ, you're sealed in Christ forever, and nothing will ever separate you from the love of God. As Paul told the Thessalonians, for our gospel came not unto you in word only, but also in power and in the Holy Ghost and in much assurance. Acts 27, 21 to 26 reads, but after long abstinence, Paul stood forth in the midst of them and said, sirs, you should have hearkened unto me, and not have loosed from Crete, and to have gained this harm and loss. And now I exhort you to be of good cheer, for there shall be no loss of any man's life among you, but of the ship. For there stood by me this night the angel of God, whose I am and whom I serve, saying, Fear not, Paul, thou must be brought before Caesar. And lo, God hath given thee all them that sail with thee. Wherefore, sirs... Be of good cheer, for I believe God, that it shall be even as it was told me. Howbeit we must be cast upon a certain island. In the midst of the storm, amid, amid the despair and hopelessness of the crew, Paul stood up. 
and Paul took over. And it's been said that Paul began as a prisoner, he ended as the captain. And this pictures his authority in the church as the apostle of the Gentiles. As Paul stood up in that storm, he began by gently rebuking the centurion, the captain and owner of the ship for ignoring, ignoring his warning about sailing at this time of the year. Paul did that, though, so that by seeing that he was right back then, all might carefully listen and heed his important words to them right now. Paul says, sirs, you should have hearkened unto me. This is what the church needs to do. This is what its spiritual leaders need to be told in this age of grace. Sirs, you should have hearkened unto Paul. The church needs to hearken unto Paul and to acknowledge his apostleship and listen to his words from Christ. Otherwise, the church ends up with harm and loss. The body of Christ needs his words, his instruction for us, the church. Paul tells his hearers to be of good cheer and assured them that there would be no loss of life among them but that only the ship would perish. He further told them that an angel of, of God, whose I am and whom I serve, had visited Paul that night and told him these things and that Paul did not need to fear because he would be brought before Caesar in Rome. Standing on that battered ship before over 250 beat down and weary people, Paul cries out above the roar of a raging sea, I believe God. Paul knew that God was faithful to his word. He could say that with conviction, and so can we. With conviction, we know we are saved by the blood of Christ. We know we are heaven bound, and we can say, I believe God that it shall be even as it was told me right here in the Word of God. Even in the most dire circumstances, we know our hope in Christ is real and true and can be trusted in every way. Paul tells them, cheer up, it's going to happen, we're going to be saved because God said it and I believe it, I believe God. Paul in his words gave those on this boat assurance of salvation. And Paul, in his words, in his letters, give the church the assurance of salvation, that by faith alone in Christ, we will arrive safely on the shores of heaven one day. Paul's faith here is evident in his God. We'll be returning to the program in just a minute. But first, we'd like to take this time to thank you, our partners, for making these programs possible. If you would like to access our library of helpful Bible study tools, go to BereanBibleSociety.org. Trials and Tribulations is a paperback 22-page booklet written by Pastor Paul M. Sadler. Life is full of temptations. This little booklet is a practical guide that gives many helpful guidelines on how to avoid the most common pitfalls. To order your copy, contact the Berean Bible Society for pricing and availability at 262-255-4750 or visit our website at www.bereanbiblesociety.org. To receive our free full-color 32-page monthly magazine, The Berean Searchlight, Call 262-255-4750 or subscribe online at www.bereanbiblesociety.org. Thank you again for your generous gifts. And now, back to the teaching with Pastor Kevin. Acts 27, 27 to 38 reads, But when the fourteenth night was come, as we were driven up and down in Adria about midnight, the shipmen deemed that they drew near to some country and sounded and found it twenty fathoms. And when they had gone a little further, they sounded again and found it fifteen fathoms. Then fearing lest we should have fallen upon rocks, they cast four anchors out of the stern and wished for the day. 
And as the shipmen were about to flee out of the ship, when they had let down the boat into the sea under color as though they would have cast anchors out of the foreship, Paul said to the centurion and to the soldiers, Except these abide in the ship, ye cannot be saved. Then the soldiers cut off the ropes of the boat and let her fall off. And while the day was coming on, Paul besought them all to take meat, saying, This day is the fourteenth day that ye have tarried and continued fasting, having taken nothing. Wherefore I pray you to take some meat, for this is for your health. For there shall not an hair fall from the head of any of you. And when he had thus spoken, he took bread and gave thanks to God in the presence of them all. And when he had broken it, he began to eat. Then were they all of good cheer, and they also took some meat. And we were in all in the ship two hundred, threescore, and sixteen souls. And when they had eaten enough, they lightened the ship and cast out the wheat into the sea. During the two weeks they'd been at sea since leaving Fair Havens, the ship had been driven five hundred miles off course and was now adrift in the Adrian Sea. At this time, the seasoned mariners sensed that they drew near to some country, that land was approaching, perhaps by the sound of breakers on the shore. So the crew took depth soundings, which was simply throwing a line into the water with lead on it to judge how deep the water was. They discovered that the water was getting shallower. The first time they did it, the water was 120 feet. Then a little farther on, it was 90 feet. This meant that immediate action needed to be taken lest they be driven on the rocks. Right away, they dropped four anchors off the stern, the back of the ship, to try and stop and hold the ship and keep it off the rocks. Then they wished for the day so they could more accurately discern their situation and the danger they were in. Being held by their anchors, their situation was perilous with the waves beating against the weakened boat and they needed the light to know what to do. The sailors did not think the vessel or they would survive their dire situation. They did not believe God like Paul did. So they formed a desperate plot to escape. They let down the lifeboat. They'd hauled up into the boat earlier in the trip and acted as though it was necessary to put out anchors from the bow and carry the anchors out away from the ship to make the ship secure fore as well as aft. Their real intention was to make for shore. It was an act unbecoming a sailor. It was an act of selfishness, revolt, and unbelief in Paul's words. Paul saw what was happening though. And he goes and he tells Julius, the centurion, and the other Roman soldiers, And he explained that the sailors needed to stay with the ship for the rest of them to be saved. They needed the sailors and their seamanship and experience in managing the ship in a critical situation. The soldiers act quickly, as soldiers are trained to do, and they cut off the ropes to the skiff and let it fall into the water. And the application is truthful. Many in the stormy voyage of the dispensation of grace, and as the storm rage, many want to cut and run. For many, it's easier to try to escape and leave rather than work through the difficulties in the church and deal with the challenges and dangers of ministry. Following this episode, as daybreak was nearing, Paul again stood before all on board and wisely instructed them to eat because they would need strength for this day. Verse 33 states that they had eaten nothing, nothing regularly, that is, they'd all not eaten well for two weeks. And it's not difficult to understand why, being on stormy seas for that long, they were all probably feeling a little green. Paul tells them to eat for their health, or survival is the idea, so that they would have the strength for the ordeal ahead. Paul then encouraged them and assured them that they would all be preserved safe and none would be lost as God had told him. And then in the middle of that stormy sea in what's been called the, the meal and the storm, Paul lifted his voice and gave thanks for that bread in the presence of them all. 
This was an unashamed testimony by Paul of faith, dependence, and gratitude to God and for his goodness. In the most dire of circumstances, he still thanked him. Paul lived what he instructed the church, in everything give thanks, for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus concerning you. We see a calm here by Paul as he provided leadership for those who weren't calm. It's been said, well, that in the storms of life, sometimes God calms the storm, and sometimes God lets the storm rage and calms his child. Verse 37 reminds us that there were 276 people on board, and according to verse 36, all 276 of those people were encouraged and in good spirits because of Paul. And all 276 people ate, as Paul had instructed them to do. They all had been hungry and had not eaten well. And because the church hasn't followed Paul in this dispensation or lived by God's instructions for us today, the church is spiritually hungry. And the, spirit, the church hasn't eaten well. It is lacking spiritual food and meat that it needs for its spiritual strength and growth of its faith. But you see here how getting fed by Paul leads to good cheer and strength and encouragement in the storm of this age. Paul's message gives good cheer as we learn about all we have in Christ, all that we are in him. In Paul's letters, we learn about all our spiritual blessings in heavenly places, the hope of glory that we have, the freedom we have in Christ, the peace that passes all understanding, the love of Christ that passes knowledge, and the confidence and boldness of our access to God. Warren Wiersbe said, there are times when one dedicated believer can change the whole atmosphere of a situation simply by trusting God and making that faith visible. Paul's faith and courage was contagious to those on the ship, and Paul's faith and courage can be contagious to us because the church needs to follow his example of faith and courage in taking the gospel of the grace of God to the world. In Philippians 4, 9, Paul wrote, Those things which you have both learned and received and heard and seen in me do, and the God of peace shall be with you. Acts 27, 39 to 44 reads, And when it was day, they knew not the land, but they discovered a certain creek with a shore, into the which they were minded, if it were possible, to thrust in the ship. And when they had taken up the anchors... They committed themselves unto the sea, and loosed the rudder bands, and hoist up the mainsail to the wind, and made toward shore. And following, falling into a place where two seas met, they ran the ship aground, and the fore part stuck fast, and remained unmovable. But the hinder part was broken with the violence of the waves. And the soldiers' counsel was to kill the prisoners, lest any of them should swim out and escape. But the centurion, willing to save Paul, kept them from their purpose and commanded that they which could swim should cast themselves first into the sea and get to land, and the rest, some on boards and some on broken pieces of the ship. And so it came to pass that they escaped all safe to land. In verse 39, when it was day, it says that they did not recognize the land. But they saw a creek, or literally bay, with a sandy beach. Here they decided to try and run the ship aground. The anchors were then taken up, or literally cut, or cast off into the sea. They didn't need four heavy anchors when the ship was to run aground, and they needed to be as light as possible. They then loosed two large steering oars on either side of the ship to help guide the ship, and they hoist up the mainsail to give them the force to run the ship as far aground as possible. They then made toward the shore. They did everything right. Unfortunately, however, they did not make it because as they headed toward the shore, they ran aground, striking an unseen sandbar, which was formed by two opposing currents, or as it says, where two seas met. 
the bow now was stuck fast in the mud and the waves immediately began beating the battered boat's stern to pieces. And I believe this is teaching how at the end of this dispensation, those violent waves which picture the nations of the world will beat against the church and persecute it. Now quick decisions had to be made, especially with the prisoners. Roman soldiers were accountable with their own lives for any prisoners who escaped. So the soldiers decided to kill all the prisoners to prevent them from swimming ashore and escaping. But Paul's presence saved their lives. Julius thought too much of Paul to permit his execution and was determined to save him. So he stopped the soldiers from carrying out their plan. The centurion then issued orders for all who could swim to dive overboard and make for land. These would then be in a position to help others, to help the rest get to the shore. The rest were instructed to get to shore the best way they could, and they used boards and clung to the debris from the ship to float on and get to shore. Then verse 44 says, they escaped all safe to land. The land was the island of Malta. But we need to pause to do the math. How many were on the ship for this voyage? 276. How many were promised by God that they would make it and survive? 276. How, ma how many made it safely to shore? 276. God is faithful. And everyone who sails with Paul in this dispensation will find spiritual safety for their Christian lives, both doctrinally and practically. And all who heed what he says to trust the gospel of grace, that Christ died for your sins and rose again, will arrive safely in glory one day. 2 Timothy 4.18 says, And the Lord shall deliver me from every evil work, and will preserve me unto his heavenly kingdom, to whom be glory forever and ever. Amen. Thank you again for tuning in to Transformed by Grace. We appreciate your prayer support and the financial gifts. The purpose and mission of the Berean Bible Society is to help you understand the whole counsel of the Word of God. For more information, visit our website at www.bereanbiblesociety.org or give us a call at 262-255-4750. Or if you prefer, write us at the Berean Bible Society, P.O. Box 756, Germantown, Wisconsin, 53022. Now until next time, may you be transformed by God's grace.